Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz are trying to say, we have a much bigger tent, and if we unite, we can then begin to solve the big problems that are facing us. Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and this week all eyes were on Kamala Harris, who made history in Chicago, becoming the first woman of color to accept the Democratic presidential nomination. A month has passed since President Biden passed the baton to his vice president, and in the ensuing weeks, and most of this week in Chicago, the focus has been all on Kamala and her new running mate, Tim Waltz. So Dems have made it official. They have their nominee, and just as importantly, they have reason to hope again. After staring down the brink of an all but ensured defeat against Donald Trump as recently as late July, the tables have turned faster than a brisk Lake Michigan wind. And while the energy in the United Center was like nothing the party had seen since Obama led the ticket, or since he spoke on Tuesday night, Kamala Harris will be the first to point out that she is still very much the underdog in this race, with polls essentially tied at the end of August. Could a convention bump carry to victory over Donald Trump? Joining me now from Chicago to discuss all this and more, former Maryland Congresswoman Donna Edwards, the first black woman elected to Congress in the state's history, and presidential historian Douglas Brinkley. But first, there's a phrase President Biden likes to repeat. Don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. Until recently, that alternative was his 2024 rival, former President Donald Trump. But roughly a month has passed since Biden dropped out of the race. Vice President Kamala Harris picked up the mantle. So it's time we look to her as that alternative. How would a Harris-Waltz administration differ from a Biden-Harris White House? There's plenty of overlap. Of course, Vice President Harris has sat in on most of President Biden's high-level meetings. She takes part in the president's daily brief, and she's led many foreign delegations herself. But there's also more daylight between the two than you might think. So let's talk about their differences when it comes to foreign policy. Biden is the most experienced foreign policy president of our generation, and he's old school. As a senator, he spent decades on the Foreign Relations Committee, and he took on a variety of diplomatic responsibilities as vice president in the Obama administration. Biden came of age during the Cold War, and he sees global actors in black and white terms between democracies and autocracies. He also buys into the great man ethos that if you sit down with another great leader and you work a personal relationship together, you can get things done. Kamala Harris came of age in a post-Cold War world. She emphasizes a rule of law approach to international norms and standards that stems from her prosecutorial background. Biden would say Russian President Vladimir Putin is doing evil things in Ukraine. Kamala Harris leans more into the sovereignty for Ukraine needs to be upheld framework. The policies are aligned. The reasons behind the policies are a little different. On China, the two are closely together on national security concerns and containing Beijing. Harris has taken a particular interest in building up other regional relationships, including her regular meetings with President Marcos of the Philippines. The pivot to Asia concept is strong under Harris, somewhat less so under Biden, not at all under Trump. And then we come to the stickiest of wickets, Israel-Palestine. And it has been awkward for Harris to try to talk about that region while supporting her boss's deference to far-right Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu. If elected, I think Kamala Harris would be much less patient with Israel's ongoing invasion of Gaza and focus more on the abuse of human rights of the Palestinians. Yes, she would continue to recognize that Israel is the most important defense partner of the United States, but she would keep that relationship on a shorter leash. And that would be a marked change for U.S.-Israel policy, but also a change that's more similar to where America's allies are with Israel going forward. Plenty has already been said about Kamala Harris's vulnerabilities when it comes to immigration, especially given that Biden tasked her with managing the southern border. That was partly because immigration was never Biden's strong suit, but also it was the hot potato that no one really wanted to touch. No doubt Republicans will hang that over her head until November. 
When it comes to polling, surveys have consistently shown Trump beating Biden on the question of who would make a stronger leader. But a recent AP survey found that Harris now ties Trump on that metric, with four in 10 Americans saying that they would trust either candidate to handle a crisis or stand up to an adversary. Just one more sign that this is a very different race from when Biden dropped out a month ago. And while Harris and Biden have plenty of overlap, voters are already seeing Kamala as her own woman. But back to the event of the week, the DNC convention in Chicago. Here to talk about Harris's nomination and all things DNC, former Congresswoman Donna Edwards and presidential historian Douglas Brinkley. Donna Edwards, Douglas Brinkley, welcome to G Zero World. Thank you. Thank you. And Douglas, I want to start with you as the presidential historian and to place this Democratic National Convention, what's already been a, a pretty uh, dramatic and different 2024 year uh, in broader historical context. I think it's extremely important because, you know, if you just cut to March and April, the Democrats were worried that they were doomed. They thought they had Joe Biden as their nominee. He was having about a 36% approval rating. Other presidents that are one-termers, like uh, Jimmy Carter losing in 1980, he was about 36%, or George Herbert Walker Bush in 1992, sitting president lost with about nine, uh, 36%. So there was concern in the Democratic Party, and then the debate happened where Joe Biden just wasn't there that day, and, and he, uh, obviously Donald Trump cleaned his clock, and from that moment on, there was the jitters. And in the end, by getting Biden to do the right thing and to do something that's quite unusual, giving up power, handing it over to uh, Kamala Harris, there created this new energy in the Democratic Party. And that is what one feels um, in Chicago throughout the convention, the United Arena is just bringing everybody together. Even if you're a, a lifelong Republican and you're in the building, they're trying to create a big tent. And so far, Harris has done this remarkable job of uh, not, not making many gaffes and working her tail off, picking the right person to be her VP, Governor Walsh of Minnesota. And so the energy level is very high, but uh, it's still a neck to neck presidential race, but at least the, there's this feeling of momentum among Democrats. Donna, talk about how you felt in the United Center so far. How is it different from what you might have thought or anticipated over the last few weeks? Well, I think the energy level has really been over the top. And, you know, for Democrats, the question is whether they're going to be able to sustain this. And I think as, you know, we've heard really throughout the convention, um, all of the speakers have really pointed to Kamala Harris's leadership, her experience, and the energy that the Harris Walls ticket really brings um, to Democrats who had been, quite frankly, a little down in the um, down in the tooth a bit uh, as uh, the um, election season has worn on. And so I think that uh, what you can feel in the spirit, and I think this word joy is really an important one because it is true that Americans are just exhausted of the chaos and the disruption over the last several years. And this campaign is bringing not just the energy, uh, but the joy, and you can really feel it in that convention hall. You said the Democrats felt down in the tooth, of course, in part because they were a little long in the tooth uh, when it came to Joe Biden um, and just how old he was and how well he could potentially stand up for another four years. He did not leave easily. He did not uh, leave voluntarily uh, until the very last moment. Um, Donna, now he's there. He gave a speech at the beginning. Uh, has that been mostly forgotten? Uh, is everyone now together? Can we close the chapter on that? Is that, I mean, is that what this joy is? Well, look, I, I think that um, on reflection, looking at Joe Biden and the way that he uh, really did come to terms with his own presidency and the uh, the ending, he actually ended with a lot of grace. And he did, you know, such a solid favor I think, to his vice president, Kamala Harris, by endorsing her right away. And I think that the unity really began with that handoff and that transition. And, you know, even as the convention has gone on for uh, several days, people are still, Democrats are still referencing the, uh, the grace and the dignity and the leadership of Joe Biden. And I think it really spoke to his comments at the opening of the convention, 
where he said, um, he, you know, quoted um, a, a song. America, America, I gave my best to you. And he said that he gave his best. And I think that Democrats are feeling that. And it makes it easy to go from that place where there was a lot of dissension into unity. Now, Douglas, how much impact do conventions typically have in an election? And what are the reasons why this might or might not be different? Well, conventions really matter, especially since 1932 when Franklin D. Roosevelt came to Chicago, and that's when he gave his famous New Deal speech. And ever since then, these conventions have become media extravaganza. That's because travel was easier by the 30s. You had opportunity to take a car, um, airplane, train. And so these conventions would gather people. And, you know, they're big moments. I mean, you think of John F. Kennedy, uh, the, the youngest president ever elected in Los Angeles, uh, you know, unleashing the whole new frontier uh, motif of his campaign. One can go on and on. Um, so, you know, they matter. But the big one for a spike, if that's what you're asking, yeah. um, Bill Clinton in 1992, he killed it. So they really can matter. And this election uh, is going to be close. We could, we all know it's down to six, seven states. And so, um, you know, every vote counts. And I think the Democrats this year in, in Chicago have done a great job of opening up the tent of what the Democratic Party is. They're allowing in people. In Chicago, I think the story's been speaker after speaker hitting home runs. I mean, listening to Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton, two former first ladies, and Hillary Clinton, of course, Secretary of State also, but it was just stunning the amount of talent that the DNC's been able to present on the stage. And they're all together. Um, also, a big historic moment here, and you've made a fair amount of history, Donna. You're the first um, black woman to represent Maryland in America's Congress. We now see the first woman of color uh, being nominated for the presidency from either party. Um, there had been a lot of criticism, right? A lot of people inside the Democratic Party saying, oh, you know, Vice President Harris is a drag on the ticket. Uh, you know, she, she wouldn't win. We, we wouldn't elect a black woman. That, that certainly has gone away in Chicago over the last few days. Talk about the history and what it means for you to be in this room. Well, well you know, Ian, I haven't heard any of that talk in Chicago, that is for sure. Um, I think that uh, Kamala Harris has actually done a rather masterful job of building on her experience as a former prosecutor, as a United States senator, as vice president, as she has begun to, you know, sort of really blossom in this role as the d nominee for the Democratic Party. And um, you can see one speaker after another throughout the convention pointing to her history, to the breadth of the Democratic tent. And it feels great, I have to say. I mean, as a, as a black woman, as a woman of color, it's very inspiring because we have keep saying every year that black women are the base of the Democratic Party, the strongest vote that they can uh, possibly give. And here you have um, this black woman of Indian descent who is at, the, at her pinnacle. And, um, and you can see it flourish throughout the convention. And what's been amazing to me is that you have Democrats um, who are showing both the history that we have from, you know, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama speaking and Joe Biden, and then the future. Um, so many governors um, who are present at the, at the convention. Democrats have a lot of history and a great bench that Kamala Harris can build on. Douglas. Yeah, you know, I think the real power brokers in the Democratic Party are Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama in different ways. But when they they are the ones that are really looking at this as how do we win? Uh, I thought President Obama is, is, you know, used to say to a lot of his aides, um, you don't have to tell them I'm the first black nominee. They're going to notice that. They're going to know that. I got to tell them what it is I'm going to do for them. And you're going to see Kamala Harris, the convention, everybody else is going to mention this, talk about it. But out of there, she doesn't need to. We know that she's going to, would be the historic first female president of the United States. We know about her um, 
you know, Indo and in um, in in black heritage. Uh, what we want to know is how are you going to help me? And so the more they can stay on an economic message and answer those questions, it's important. And then I, it is the big tent, but I noticed some issues have faded. Climate change was such a big. A talking point for Democrats, and it seems to have faded from the convention. Now, Bernie Sanders evoked it in a, in a powerful way. Um, but, you know, they're starting to trim it down to that economic message, how we'll make life better for you. Potential pitfall for Kamala Harris is how do you talk about Gaza? Um, and in Chicago, when people were thinking this is 1968, it is not. It's the city's beautiful. There are people in outdoor cafes. There's harmony in the convention. And yes, there are protests, but they're in a kind of sequestered area. And they're expressing their, their ideas. There have been a few arrests. But um, it, it, nevertheless, that issue is a tinderbox one because things change in the Middle East daily. And uh, Vice President Harris has to be careful how she talks about that particular issue. So, Douglas, let me ask you, coming out of this, what are you most worried about? Um, well, that, I think first see what the bounce is out of the convention, how many people are watching. I really agree with what was just said. I think some of this convention is going to bring independence to the Democratic Party and some Republicans. Barack Obama gave a master class, like a grassroots organizer, on how to bring people in. He wasn't shaming anybody. He said, come on in, you know, where we have more, more in common than we, we, and let's go back to some older values in America that are, that, you know, grandparents may have had. Um, and then the problem is going to be the debate. And um, that's going to be Kamala Harris versus Donald Trump. And who knows what's going to happen? Donald Trump is erratic, but that creates hard to know what there's nothing off limits with him. So you're not sure what he might go and without fact checking with Trump. You're, you're suddenly having to answer something that's not true and it's easy to get confused. So I think that's the next big, um, the big point. Then we'll see how the VP debate goes, see if there's another debate. It's all about money, donors, fundraising. What I think the Democrats have going for them is an enthusiasm and they've got to hold on to it. There's some people in the Democratic Party that will say, lose the sugar high, get real now. I say, I wouldn't lose the sugar high. Race with as much adrenaline as you can to that finish line because it's going to be neck to neck. Donna, what worries you the most in the next few months? Well, I, I do get um, concerned as we're moving into this um, part of the campaign season that's going to be about, um, about debates and day-to-day. Uh, -to -day. Um, what worries me is that for, uh, for Democrats, I think it is important to maintain that enthusiasm. You know, on, a, on an election day where, depending on where you are, you could have rain, snow, sleet, and hail, um, that it's going to be important to have voters who are enthusiastic about going to the polls, who no matter what um, are going to stand in, in lines, even if those lines are long, long, who are going to cast those ballots, those early ballots that need to be counted. And Democrats actually have a lot to, uh, to build on um, because that enthusiasm has transformed into money. There have been record amounts of um, money raised um, by Kamala Harris since she got into the race. The question is, how is that going to be deployed? Is it going to be deployed on the ground where it can make the most difference or just on uh, the airwaves? I think that um, that kind of strategy is going to be really important as we get to the, uh, to the end. And one of the things that's actually been quite impressive um, that is different about the Harris campaign versus the Biden campaign is that the Harris campaign is responding in real time every single time that Donald Trump does or says something outrageous um, to check him. I suspect that that's going to happen in the debates, but I agree with Douglas that uh, Donald Trump is so erratic and unpredictable and that he will say outrageous things. And I think Kamala Harris has to be in a position to fact check him in real time and not depend on the debate moderators um, to do that. And for Donald Trump, I think the danger is that he continues to say things about uh, Harris, whether it's about her, her looks or her personality or her laugh or all of these sort of personal qualities that I think are incredibly offensive. And if he doesn't change that track, then I think he's going to lose even more independent and Republican voters. Donna Edwards, Douglas Brinkley, thanks so much for joining today on G-Zero.
Thank you. That's our show this week. Come back next week, and if you like what you've seen, or even if you don't, but you're thinking, hey, I'd love to have my own convention in Chicago, why don't you take a moment to check us out at g0media.com.